Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you for this debate and discussion on raising the bar for the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, a geeky notion to some, but absolutely central um, if we are to recover properly from our current crisis, but also tackle the, the major, uh, what was being regarded as the existential, I don't know why they call it that, existential notion of climate change and climate challenge in that regard. We have a number of contributors here for you today to engage with you on this particular topic, which, um, whilst it's all about a target, actually it's politics and effort and political commitment and investment that matters. Before I say anything further, I first want to first set out the rules of engagement, if you like. Um, those of you uh, on Zoom, a very warm welcome to you. I ask you to stay muted, make sure your name's on your screen, and obviously you're visible. Use your virtual hand if you want to raise a question and engage with the discussion. If you don't know where that is, go to the participants icon and you'll press on that and you'll find your virtual hand, so use that. Otherwise, stay muted until I call you but do use your virtual hand but also I, I encourage you to use a zoom chat um, that's also available to you we find that that's a really useful way to create the uh, dis discussion and dialogue simply around this discussion as well you might have ideas you might have resources you might have uh, documents or other comments to make so please use the zoom chat uh, as freely as you can we also have a live stream audience so a warm welcome to all of you you are not forgotten or left out if you wish to engage with this discussion use hashtag foe debate to post your question and i will try and take as many of you as possible so that's that's the rules of the game um, as i was saying this is about targets and renewable energy we've heard today from you know the leak uh, of the documentation in Euroactive that, you know, the target's 3840. Uh, but actually, at the end of the day, uh, what we do know is we need greater speed. We need better efficiency in the administrative processes for the private sector and the public sector to work in a manner that they have never done so before, especially given the context we find ourselves in in terms of the climate challenge. We know temperatures are higher than they've ever been and they're likely to increase. And actually, the timescales, even that the IPCC reports have predicted, are shorter, that we know that for sure. So this conversation is really about thinking about what a public sector entity such as the EU can do to motivate, stimulate and play its role in public governance but also public leadership uh, and public funding to escalate and accelerate um, our approach to renewable energy uh, as, as a central feature of what we do in terms of our consumption lifestyles and our industrial base. I'm very pleased to welcome first a politician. We have the Minister of Energy for, from Luxembourg, Claude. Claude, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you for joining us. You're also, you've also been in the European Parliament, uh, rapporteur, and you've, you've produced a, uh, an interesting, provocative, controversial, you know, inside view, uh, a book also. Um, thank you for joining us. Claude, um, give us your perspective on where we find ourselves at the moment. You've seen, you know, we've had the uh, global conversations, we've had Biden saying what he has, we've had the Chinese saying what they have, and others. And there we are in Europe, uh, all of us globally caught in a health and economic crisis, but we know that the climate, ch climate crisis has never gone away, it's only accelerated. What's your view on where we find ourselves in terms of the target and where you think things are moving? Claude, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that the Friday, uh, the F Friday for Future movement, which started two, two years, three years ago, has completely changed at least the dynamics in Europe. So what was uh, a less mainstream issue, uh, fighting for climate change is now everywhere. Uh, look to the situation in Germany where the Conservative Party is now basically <laughs> trying to get a, a higher target every day in order to catch up with, with what is the mainstream in societies. And uh, that Fridays for Future movement also allowed Europe to go at EU level to the 55% uh, climate change reduction. Um, good, and, and, and then now it's of course, how do we deliver? And we have to deliver fast. And renewables, solar, wind onshore, wind offshore, hydro, the, it's hope. It's, the only hope that we can be fast enough in the race against climate change, uh, it is jobs and uh, 
it's I think we should copy what Biden is doing in US, uh, rolling out massively renewables and then also caring for jobs uh, in US. And in Europe, what we are still missing is the energy political dimension of the energy transition. Uh, on wind, onshore and offshore, we are quite competitive. On solar, we, are, we have lost almost all PV production manufacturing in Europe, which is really, really not, not acceptable. And we have to be up and running on electric chargers, electric cars, trucks, uh, high voltage grids, transformators. So the industrial policy dimensions, that's still what I, I feel is a bit missing and we should co copy Biden. And then it's hope for this almost hundreds of millions of people in Africa and other places in the world which don't even have access to electricity and solar costs are now so low mm -hmm. that electricity uh, out of PV can go to all uh, villages. So uh, back to Europe, now is also the moment to have a consistent, ambitious EU revision of the Renewable Directive. We need higher ambition. I think we should go from 32 to at least 38 uh, 40, uh, especially by front loading also offshore wind because of its huge uh, running uh, hours. Uh, now is also the moment to concentrate on uh, electricity heating. So heat pumps will play an enormous role. And for example, in Luxembourg, we passed a law uh, this week uh, where all new buildings not only the re residential, but also office buildings have to be electricity only. So heat pumps will be central and then transportation will move electric. And therefore, uh, if we want to decarbonize quickly heating and transport, we need, of course, to be even faster on especially renewable electric. Claude, um, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure whether you agree or not, but I feel that the time that we have is very limited. It's got shorter, and it feels like we have a, a window. People used to say there's a window of 10 years. It feels like there's a window of five years. What's the political mood music amongst your other colleagues in the energy uh, ministerial, let's say, those of you who come together, um, in terms of renewable energy uh, being the thing that we need to focus on? If you can share your thoughts on that. Um. So we haven't met for quite some time. We will meet on the 11th of June uh, to discuss the 10E regulation and to do a common position. And I see a lot of positive movements. Uh, 10E will be without gas and we will block all investments into gas. And 10E will be above all uh, what Katerina and myself has discussed years ago, which is a European supergrid where we uh, bring the huge large-scale offshore wind in the North Sea, in the Baltic, in the Black Sea, not only to the coastal states, but also to the landlocked countries uh, like uh, Slovak, Czech, uh, Luxembourg, Austria. So now, and, and, and I see a lot of positive energy and commitment uh, all through all countries. So the time where renewables was uh, not important for Czech Republic or Slovak Republic or for somebody like Poland, I think mm. this time is over. That's good to hear, and it's good to get your reactions, colleagues. For those of you who might be closer to those states, or we have a different perspective in terms of where you're sitting, whether either you're from the private sector, civil society sector, or uh, you know from a member state nearby. But it'd be good to get. Thank you, Claude, for that, and I'm sure we'll come back to you on some of the points that you raised. Let's now move to a private sector perspective. We have um, uh, we have Claire from NG. Welcome to you. Welcome. Thank you. Very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Claire, for joining us. Um, you know, you, you're in a, um, in a very senior position in the company, um, and you're, you're, you, know, you, know, you're, you have a particular view uh, on this agenda. But in this context of this conversation about renewable energy, Claire, share with us what is it from your perspective that you seek from the private sector uh, perspective on the Renewable Energy Directive. There's been a lot of talk that lobbyists mm -hmm. have worked hard to reduce targets. I'm sure you're not one of those in that game, but others are commenting, if I can say, that the private sector have, in effect, emaciated the directive. What's your perspective? I think, share with us why this matters and what you're doing around it. Mm -hmm. well, very happy to be uh, to you. be with you as a as a friend of Europe. Uh, so maybe 
first a, a few very quick words on Engie, uh, just to say that we are active across the whole renewable uh, dimensions. We are a very active player in PV, in so wind and solar, uh, wind both onshore and offshore. We are active in hydro, and we also very much uh, believe in green gases, BV, biomethane, or green hydrogen. So very much active across the scope. Uh, with a, an electricity mix that's currently more than 30% renewables and the aim to be uh, slightly below 60 by 2030. So uh, we are very ambitious and we have put our ambition on the development of renewable. So all the efforts that are currently put by the European Commission, by the member states, to increase the ambition in renewable are, uh, of course, very, very welcome. We, we are very much at the, at the core of this. Uh, maybe a word to rebound on what Claude was uh, saying and then going to, to the directive. Um, we, we will be moving in a world that's more and more uh, reliant on electricity, mm. and that's a no-brainer. Mm. Uh, at the same time, we need to be very careful about the impact of what we're doing on competitiveness for mm. our companies purchasing power for our people and security of supply. And in this respect, uh, I would like to, uh, to very much uh, welcome the work that's currently done on uh, sector integration. I'm a firm believer that it's by taking a holistic view on the energy mix, on what are the uses that are the most uh, difficult to abate versus the, the uses that can move quickly to electricity, that we will be able to uh, optimize the system. And, uh, and in particular, I, I firmly believe that uh, while gas is currently uh, mostly fossil gas, it will green itself mm -hmm. in the next few years, and it has a major role to play in the, in the end picture as a, as a green gas, be it uh, biomethane or, or green hydrogen again. Um, so maybe moving to, uh, to the directive. Yes. Uh, Certainly not, no desire on, uh, on our side, on the contrary, to, to reduce the ambition. Uh, first, uh, the targets are welcome. We, we even, and they, they should be, I mean, the perimeter should be kept. We think the targets need to be indeed increased. Uh, we also think that uh, the directive would be uh, probably even more effective uh, with national uh, targets. Mm which could be accompanied by some kind of voluntary transnational cooperation for, on some issues, uh, such as uh, offshore wind. Uh, that's the first, first message. Keep the ambition of the directive. That's mm -hmm. very much what private actors are, are waiting for. Second message, uh, we need the directive to be effective. When we think about renewable, there are a number of issues slowing down the development of renewable in Europe, mm -hmm. be it the difficulty in permitting, administration, acceptance issue. Uh, we need market support. We need PPAs to be encouraged. So this whole environment, uh, which is not only financial, very much has to be taken into account in the directive for it to be, to be effective. And then last thing, uh, last thing, we need the, the, the directive to, uh, to well, we need to make sure that uh, green gases find a, a specific support. You were talking uh, earlier about how, uh, well, the battle was lost, the industrial battle was lost mm. on some segments of renewables. Yes. And indeed, uh, when you look at PV, uh, when you look at uh, solar, uh, so in particular, the prices have gone down tremendously, but indeed this has been largely through imports from China in particular of, uh, of solar panels. When we think of renewables today, and especially green gases, they are at an early stage of their development, so their relative prices are still high, but they have a huge potential, and this can be local. So we need to win collectively the battle of biomethane, we need to win the, ba the battle of green hydrogen which means that they will need specific support mm -hmm. as they're not competitive yet and they need to develop. And mechanisms that, uh, that the European Commission are working on, such as uh, guarantees of origins in particular, can, uh, can play an important role in, in the development as well. And last thing, this is part of the package. And as we know, uh, EU funding and national support mechanisms are key, but 
the most effective signal for investments to move into renewables is a high and robust carbon pricing. So that's my last words. There is complementarity between red directive, red two, and what will be done uh, elsewhere, in particular in the EU ETS revision. Claire, that's been hugely helpful. And I mean, it's great that you know, you've been really specific about the ask and what the issues are. But can I just press upon you just briefly, because I know we'll come mm -hmm. back to you in this conversation, others will. And I encourage those of you who are listening, you know, use the Zoom chat or you raise your virtual hand. There's lots being said about the, in the super grid. You know, we've known the discussion over the years around whether we can have, as we're Claude saying, this kind of grid that requires a level of intra interoperability and agreement if this is going to work. And then there's the issue of how do we make sure, in terms of the context of global supply chains, as you, as you remark, um, you know, solar panels are well, very, very cheap, have been very cheap, but because of the Chinese, and we have a different relationship mm -hmm. now. What do you think, what do you need very specifically uh, from the Commission and member states for both those elements to work, the super grid, but also the supply of the, let's say, the hardware to make the software of energy work? Well, I think uh, we need first, when we think about sectors, we, we, need, uh, uh, we, need a we need some proper work to take into account the European dimension of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, of networks, uh, be it in electricity or be it uh, be it in gases, and it's not only it's not only about grids. Uh, when you think about the role of uh, green hydrogen tomorrow and the role it can play in the system, we will very likely need a European backbone mm -hmm. uh, that's an infrastructure that will be able to carry uh, green hydrogen into into the pipes from one one part of Europe to uh, to the other. So I think thinking infrastructures, both electric infrastructures, but also gas infrastructures, mm. and thinking sector integration. Mm. So the complementarity between, between the two uh, is, is, uh, is very important. Uh, on how, how do we promote uh, the fact that uh, we will not only rely on, uh, on imports? Well, I think on, on, we can still uh, try to help develop some some parts of the system, I would say, uh, and new, uh, for instance, new types of solar panels in in, uh, in some of our countries. Mm -hmm. But but the reality is that the, uh, at least the basic uh, solar solar panels are clearly uh, coming from imports and and indeed are cheaper thanks to this. What, when you, we turn to new technology, when we need we turn sorry to uh, green gases in particular. I think that we have a big market in Europe. We have an advance because we have some infrastructures, be it storage, be it, uh, be it pipes to carry, uh, to carry, uh, the, uh, to carry the gases. Mm -hmm. We have some great technologies, liquefaction technologies. So there's no reason for Europe to lose this battle. Mm -hmm. But we should have a framework that encourages the uses of these green gases with a binding target, for instance, for green gases that will help create the demand. And I'm very convinced that the capacities of production will be there if we have the demand. Great, Claire, thank you very much. for that. Again, I'll come back to you and I'm sure people have comments to make. But you know, one of the things you signaled in your, in your input was that we've moved from something which was both Europe-wide and member state binding to something which is a Europe-wide target. So actually the high performers can shield the low performers and also it's not enforceable at a local level. So that's a kind of a key message, isn't it? A political message to uh, folk about this agenda and the importance of it. But let's turn to, and as you say, locality will matter because what municipalities do what member states will do to create the ecology and the market is going to be central in this. Uh, colleagues, engage with the debate. What's your view? What's your reaction to this? I already have one person that's uh, keen to come in. That's Dan Travers. Welcome, Dan. And Corrado, I, I, can, can, Corrado, I can see your hand up. I'll bring you in in a moment. So, Dan, please introduce yourself and a warm welcome to you. Yeah, so Dan Travers, I'm um, from a non-profit company, Open Climate Fix, who's uh, doing short-term forecasting of PV outturn in order to, uh, to allow the grid to optimise better. So this is basically all about increasing the information that we've got available on that, you know, the, the predictability of the renewables, which is one of the, Great. the, the mm -hmm. problems, the challenges. One of the things I'm concerned about, I think we are concerned about from 
working with uh, most of the UK electricity grid so far has been the opacity in terms of information. Mm. Um, the, you know, what I'm looking for is, is there, is there something, and I, I don't think there's enough talk about this at the moment, but maybe there is behind the scenes about opening up more of the data that is available. So at the moment, just the largest generators generally report data transparently. And as we've moved to a decentralized system, there's many, many more generators providing an increasingly large percentage of the overall generation mix from solar to wind to and batteries soon mm -hmm. as well. It's going to be really important to push that information out to the, to the, uh, to the, to the market and to the, 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 also the transmission operators. Is there any plans for that? Um, any discussions and what people thoughts on that? And Dan, just for those of us, just for the kind of let's say, democracy of understanding the issue, why is that important? Good question. Um, so the reason it's important is because it's extremely difficult for the transmission system operators and even for the low voltage operators to, to balance the grid and keep everything completely in balance when there are potentially thousands or tens of thousands of micro generators everywhere and micro storage facilities um, which are operating without any knowledge, so completely in the dark to mm -hmm. the transmission system operators. Whereas that was relatively simple 20 years ago when you had a very much a top-down, you know, coal, nuclear, um, gas generation being fed into um, the, to, to supply the load. Um, so as we move into that that much more complicated and decentralised grid, we need the transmission system operators to balance the grid, or they're going to have to really just stumble in the dark a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, Dan. That's really very good question, and also thank you for responding to the, my my, my question in that regard. Because really, at the end of the day, it's about having an overview of demand and supply, but also really understanding production uh, across across the piece. That therefore, what does the market look like? But also how you don't clutter it, but also how you make sure it's clean. Also, thank you for that, and I'm sure that colleagues, I will ask uh, Claude to just think about that in terms of what you've just said. But also from private sector, it would be good to get Claire's response, but other other speakers we have. I I have Corrado, you have raised your hand. A warm welcome to you. Please introduce yourself. Do you hear me? I can, we can, absolutely. Yes, okay. Um, uh, I have um, uh, Rights Foundation. So I'm working for the Rights Foundation. I've been with the Commission a long time. Uh -huh. And thank you for inviting me. I re wish to react to what, uh, to what Claire said. Um, I agree with her, but. First of all, on carbon price. Carbon price is far too low. 40 is far too low. Without 75, we cannot reach a target. But Canada has now 130 US dollars, mm -hmm. 170 Canadian as a, card, uh, as a target price. Uh, Sweden is quite above. Uh, around 80 or 85, if I remember well. They know what they are doing. Biden nice. has no carbon price at all. Mm. So I think this is a key issue. Second is technology. Mm. I agree that we have to look at the technology developments, but why not those developments in nuclear? Mm. And there is a political position yes. <clears throat> which is blocking it. And without that, without including it in the mix, we cannot reach the target. Uh, the third thing is acceptance. I think the acceptance for at least the wind energy is not there. Mm. It is in the cities because they don't care, but it's not. <laughs> in the and I think there we have to find, I mean, realize that the laws in, it, in Europe are participative normally uh, and uh, um, amenable to um, decentralization, fine, but there's a lack of transparency, there's a legal compliance problem, there's a discrimination in favor of powerful interests, and there's a failure to secure public information and reaction. Mm -hmm. And unless we do so, and we are, by the way, not in line with the European, with the Ar Aarhus Convention, condemned several times, we don't care because we have a majority there. If we do not make sure that the delivery needs also citizen support, I think we are in great uh, trouble. And the last point is on energy mix. Mm -hmm. First of all, we need nuclear, of course. 
But in the energy mix, we have to make be careful not to overstress one mm -hmm. item as compared to others. And there, the item is, is overstressed is uh, the wind energy, which is based on the primes model, which is wrong. The primes model of the commission is indicating okay. savings on uh, CO2, which are simply not there. So. Okay. Karaja, thank you for raising a number of really important issues, but also um, in all of these debates that we have around energy at Friends of Europe, nuclear always comes up. And it's also been acknowledged as being an issue of uh, problematic politics, uh, but also about its history. But there's a, there's a real rising uh, momentum, if you like, about do something about it, uh, take away the politics if you can, but introduce it into the energy mix, and it will accelerate what we can achieve. But thank you for that. And people do react to what you've heard from Corrado, especially around the carbon pricing. Um, it would be interesting to know whether what you think the EU should be doing about carbon pricing. You know, you've just heard that we've got these differential levels. Is it the role of the EU to make sure it creates a market by creating a price threshold? Uh, is that the way forward? So it would be good to hear from you. Simone, I have Simone Schmidt uh, who wishes to come in. Simon? I hope I've got the name right. Welcome. I, I, always, I always get your name wrong. I do apologize. Do introduce yeah. yourself. No, no, it's, it's Simon Smith. Simon. I mean, uh, I, uh, I will introduce myself. I'm uh, Simon Smith of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Luxembourg. So, Claude Turmus, uh, we are both uh, at home in, in, in Luxembourg. Uh, let's say the, the, the fact that we are not um, uh, having a position anymore in solar, in uh, photovoltaics, is, is a real shame. Uh, that, that, that could have been, uh, in my opinion, could have been uh, prevented. Now we have that situation, we have to rebuild as soon as possible. So my question is basically, is there any kind of um, policy which uh, might bring us back to a strong position in, uh, in, in solar? Uh, maybe it's uh, in the industrial policy, the, the just uh, updated industrial policy of the commission is doing this. Is there anything which can help us? Again, um, those of you who are in the chat and those of you in the know, please respond on the Zoom chat. But also, I will come back to uh, Claude in response to that also. Because uh, I think the, the thing about, isn't it fascinating that, that to have lost the game or the race on solar? Um, and why do we do not use foresight enough? OK, a crisis comes left field. But clearly, we could have been ahead of the game in the way that we were and kept our level, if you like. But let's, let's come back to that with the implication of industrial strategy. And also, tomorrow, there will be a discussion and in months to come around the industrial policy from our, from our perspective anyway. But I want to go back to our speakers now. Patrick, if I can invite you to come in now. Um, thank you. Um, you've, had a, you know, you've been able to listen to the, the discussion so far. Um, one of the things that I think has um, surprised us on this debate is the, the jumpiness of emissions. You know, we were in lockdown, we saw at clear skies, the air was cleaner, we saw all over the world the impact of emissions. But now, as I understand it, you know, we're going to see uh, a jump, second biggest annual rise in history. Um, do you feel, from your perspective, the member states are up to it in tackling this issue in terms of their plans and how we move forward? Over to you, Patrick. Great. No, thanks very much. And thanks very much for inviting me. Just a quick introduction. I'm from the European Environmental Bureau. We're an NGO umbrella, 100, over 165 members, all member states and 30 million people we represent. No, thanks for the, for the question. Um, I actually find this trend particularly worrying, but it's also a little bit emblematic of our lack of uh, sufficient, uh, sufficient ambition and commitment to addressing the unfolding uh, climate catastrophe. Um, and they say that policymaking is the art of the possible. Um, but the impossibility of doing more now, I think, pales when compared to the impossibility of, of tackling climate catastrophe later. And I think and one takeaway is that we should actually think again as to what is possible. So we need a transformative agenda. So part of that, of course, is the NRPs and part of that is the red. So I'll pick up those two points Please. on the national recovery and resilience plans. And they're not all in yet. Mm. Um, about half the member states are in. But from what I understand, around 30 percent of the grants so far focus basically on on clean power and building renovation. Um, it's not all in yet, so we can't say everything. The commitment is 37 
uh, on, on terms of climate. Um, renewables plays an important role in some countries, but it's basically a missed opportunity in a lot of, lot of others. And I think it's useful to highlight a few things. I mean, Slovenia, they're investing in a first geothermal plant, but they're also investing in grid strengthening. And I think a pro point made earlier was the grid, how much can the grid, you know, we need to invest in a grid to be able to now renewable, so that's good. There's also in, in Poland some renewable energy community investments and so on and so forth. But while there's a lot of good examples, there's also sort of missed opportunities more widely and some weaknesses, because part of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan should be on investment, but part of it should be on policy reforms. Mm -hmm. And the Commission will be looking at both of that at the moment. So one thing which is missing is there hasn't been um, um, really much use of, of carbon pricing, which is the issue mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been much use of green public procurement, which is again a 14% yes. of European GDP. Yes. There hasn't been much use of subsidy reform. So I think there's a number of missed opportunities in the, in the current issues. And there's also some concerns about opportunity costs of where you're spending the money. For example, there was a mention of hydrogen, but I think some of the investments in the, in the NRPs are focused on hydrogen for transport. I don't think this is the most cost effective way of building back better in the current climate. I mean, I'm for hydrogen, green hydrogen, that is, not the risks of wider hydrogen. So what we basically need to, so this, okay, this 30% is broadly, say, around 100 billion, it'll be a bit more, but to put that in perspective, to transform the European economy needs about a trillion a year. Mm -hmm. So this is important money, it's catalytic money, it's insufficient money, it requires also private sector investment, citizens and other governments. Um, so I think it'll be quite important though to get this catalyst right, so it's beholden on the Commission to check all these NRPs and push the good practice and weed out the bad practice, ensure in particular that the, the policy reforms are there, um, because the money can't be sp played twice. Another poor practice is that some countries are using the opportunity to deregulate and push back on environmental controls and run against the Green Deal. Again, that sort of is, 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 is unacceptable. Um, but on the second part, I think it's on the, on the, on the Renewable Energy Directive, and, and um, Claude, you mentioned 38 to 40 percent as a target, and this, this conference is about raising the bar. We spent two years uh, developing a Paris Agreement compatible scenario together with uh, citizen CSOs across Europe, and particularly partners, Can Europe, but also academia, and we found it is possible to have 100 percent renewables, but to get to get a renewables grid, but to get there, we actually need 50 percent renewables by 2030, or else all you're doing is you're shifting the burden onto yeah. the generation after 2030. Yeah. And in that context, we feel that the raising the bar is on the red is hugely important, but it's not just the percentage target. We actually think that member states should actually have a target. In the, previously in the 2020-2020 uh, con policy context, member states did have a binding target. And you don't really want to let member states um, have, have the potential of doing less than they could and less than they should. But it's not only about the bar, but it's also about the criteria. And I think there's a huge importance of the environmental criteria in the red being fixed. At the moment, there's a big loopholes in the red environmental criteria, for example, for biomass burning. Um, that needs to be addressed and needs to be a biodiversity, needs to be protected uh, by protecting the higher value uh, nature. On hydrogen, Green hydrogen is fantastic, but we should be super careful not to accidentally support fossil hydrogen in mm -hmm. this in mm -hmm. this mix, because there is this 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 wider wider game. So gas, you know, so that's that's good, and I think I'm probably using up my five. No, I've got three seconds left. <laughs> um, so just on that, I think just the planning and implementation is, is huge. We mentioned NROPs, but just to remind people that the national energy and climate plans are also fundamentally important. A lot of these have been set up with the old target of 32.5, but we need to up it because it is, it is this generation's responsibility to basically catalyze the renewable um, revolution such that we leave a better planet for everyone else. And it's also about resilience. Maybe to get back to the beginning where I started, mm. the impossibility of doing more now now pales, in, in, pales into insignificance compared to the impossibility of facing the future if we don't do more now. I think that we should echo through when we think about is 38, 40 sufficient? I don't think it is. Patrick, thank you. Thank you. you, know, you also remind us, and this is that thing uh, I was saying to colleagues that you know, come, um, being in Brussels right now, um, and you know, with the lifting of all sorts of kind of lockdown measures, it's almost as if the streets have forgotten the crisis and the traffic 
is phenomenal. And there's something about the fact that we, we refuse to under, learn from the lessons of crises. You know, we've just come through one of the biggest hits in a century, and we are still quibbling about targets when we know that the climate emergency is upon us and it's going to be much worse than what we are experiencing at the moment. We know it's going to be much worse, but there's something about our human nature that it's only adversity that shifts us in the positive direction. I love the way you created that kind of love, uh, that triangulation of policy, pricing, and procurement. And I'd really welcome, if you can, just very briefly, very briefly, say something about the pricing issue from your perspective in terms of what should the EU do? Because there's a lot in this game, right? There's a lot about the energy mix. There's a lot of different initiatives that are taking place. In the context of time is running out, right? If we put it in that context, what would you want to focus on that will be the lever to really dramatically accelerate things? What would be that one thing? Was it pricing? Uh, yeah. I know it's a okay. question, Patrick. Sure, sure, sure. No, I think let's go, let's go with pricing because that's the subject. I think, but the pricing needs to be looked at at a multiple level. I mean, it is the reform of the, of the EU emissions trading scheme, but it's also the excise tax reform. We need to move towards having a proper carbon tax. It's also the carbon border tax, uh, border adjustment mechanism to make sure that Europe is, is fairly treated in this world. And so our initiatives are not undermined. But we often forget the green public procurements. This is huge. Yeah. This is much more. And then the, the other element is, is we've mentioned this for donkey's years about um, subsidy reform. We have mm -hmm. too many subsidies. If you don't get rid of the harmful subsidies, then you can you have to throw twice as much amount of money at um, at the solutions. So really, the first thing was get rid of the harmful subsidies. Mm. Absolutely. Patrick, and what you're also pointing us to is that sometimes as policymakers and decision makers, you need to peer over the balcony of society and actually see the dynamic between procurement, subsidies, investment, innovation and, and the citizen dimension. And we somehow don't join the dots up. But that's what we're trying to do at Friends of Europe in this conversation. On that note, I want to move to Katerina. Katerina, thank you. Very warm welcome for joining us. Um, I would like you to comment on the issue of member states, in particular around how can we use the fact that we, there's yet another bit of a global momentum taking place. We have a commission that's producing a target which should be higher potentially and should be higher. Uh, there's politics around investment and what will happen to global, global supply chains and the future of in industrial base. And yet we have something which has moved from being, um, let's say, uh, a target that was potentially of enforceable to something which is voluntary, if you like. How do we kind of shift the dial on this from your perspective? And how important is it? And welcome, Katrina. Big questions, I know, and difficult ones. Many thanks and good afternoon, everybody. Very pleased to be here in this uh, very important and interesting discussion today. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let me start with the uh, current renewables directive, which was adopted a couple of years ago and which is currently being implemented by member states. So member states will transpose it uh, in their law by this coming June. Uh, so we have to keep this starting point in mind and what does the current renewables directive do? So first it sets this uh, uh, binding EU level target, which is now 32% for 2030. But it also defines as part of the governance regulation, um, a so-called formula that determines the member states trajectory uh, towards this EU level target. And this formula is based on the one hand on the renewables potential in each member state, but then also on their uh, financial economic possibilities to uh, deliver uh, much more renewable, so on fairness at the same time. Um, and then in addition, the current renewables directive uh, includes a number of measures that would enable then the renewables target to be met. And here I can mention that on, on permitting that was already mentioned mm. and also on uh, sustainability criteria on biomass among others. Uh, so what have we then seen from the national energy and climate plans that we have uh, received? Mm -hmm. um, we have seen that member states uh, will reach a target uh, of 33.1 or 33.7% uh, percent of renewables by 2030. So this shows that the current approach does deliver. Uh, mm -hmm. We have also seen in the, in the recovery plans that we have started analyzing now quite a lot of uh, investments planned in renewables. So 
which is very positive. Uh, and we will look into the, those in, in more detail and come back then uh, as need be. But this, of course, is not enough, uh, as we've heard already uh, today by all the previous speakers. Um, now, as the EU leaders agreed to increase the overall ambition of greenhouse gas reduction uh, to 55% at least by 2030, and to be carbon neutral by 2050, we need to do more uh, in all fronts. So we are currently working on what is called now Fit for 55 package, mm. and it will include a number of legal texts, ETS, Energy Taxation Directive, Energy Efficiency Directive, uh, Carbon Border Adjustment, uh, Effort Sharing uh, Directive, and most importantly, of course, the Renewables Directive that we are discussing here today. So this whole package has to be seen uh, together. There are a lot of synergies uh, between uh, the different pieces. But what we then want to do, uh, and colleagues have already referred to uh, the first aim, which is to bring the renewables target uh, up to speed with the 55% uh, greenhouse gas reduction target. Mm -hmm. Here, we ha you have all seen, and it has been mentioned today, that in the climate target plan that announced the 55%, um, we estimated that uh, at least 38 to 40% would be the uh, economically efficient target for renewables. So we are currently uh, further analyzing this. Uh, but second, um, we must also be sure that any target is underpinned by concrete measures across various sectors and in particular now those sectors that have until now been more difficult uh, in their uptake of renewables. And here I'm thinking of uh, heating and cooling, mm -hmm. transport and industry in particular. And the type of measures that we are looking at include guarantees of origin, certification, um, requiring renewables when renovating houses, uh, 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 PPAs, uh, so many of the uh, elements that colleagues have raised today. So indeed, uh, only targets without measures is not uh, expected to be a very uh, good way forward. But then before closing, um, then uh, the question on whether uh, to translate uh, this EU level binding target to national binding targets as it used to be mm -hmm. uh, for the 2020 situation. And here, as I mentioned, that we have seen that the current approach does work, uh, as we have also seen uh, that uh, member states, all of them, uh, and I think Claude referred to this in the beginning, now see renewables of, uh, that the renewables is something for them as well, be it then uh, for offshore wind in Poland or be it uh, uh, perhaps uh, bioenergy in, uh, in Czechia. But all member states now see renewables as a very positive element for their energy mix and also for their uh, energy security. Mm. So that is why we uh, currently do not uh, consider uh, bringing a binding national target to the uh, revised uh, uh, regulation, uh, sorry, directive, uh, but intend to continue with the current approach and also, of course, looking at the formula that sets the uh, expected speed for member states, uh, although not binding. So, but Katrina, Katrina, if I may just challenge you just a little bit because I'm trying to make sense of this. On the one hand, the binding targets approach has worked. Right. That's what you're saying, that you, what we've demonstrated so far. And what you're saying is now in the future, we don't need that. But I don't know why. Can you explain uh, that to us? Binding EU level target works. No, I mean, to about, mem but about member state level. Uh, the binding target for member states that was for 2020 um, has not actually worked for all member states. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, no, but, so, uh, but, but the actual relationship that was created in the construction of the relationship, should it not actually be binding at the member state level? Because on the one hand, whilst the EU level, what, that goes back to the point that D Darren made, what we don't understand is what the data tells us about the impact of that regionally, country by country, and, else, and what actually is the, the case in the picture. Um, in the context of data-based, evidence-based policymaking, isn't it foolhardy not to have member state binding targets? Um, 
I think it's a very much a question of um, what one wants to achieve and, and how. And as we have now seen that with the national energy and climate plans, we are going beyond the old target of 2030. Uh, in the end, uh, I think it brings, it gives more flexibility. It gives, in terms of time for member states, it gives them more time to adjust. It gives them more time to do their plans properly. Uh, so therefore, from this analysis, mm -hmm. we still consider, uh, unless there is a contrary evidence, of course, uh, that it is better, given also the urgency and the um, wish not to enter to very, very long in the institutional negotiations mm -hmm. on every figure, yeah. that more, it's more efficient at this point of time to move with the current approach, which is EU level target, update it, bring it to different sectors, and then uh, continue on this member state trajectory basis, which is indeed uh, at this point of time, not legally binding, but it okay. gives- sure. uh, Okay. It's a benchmark. I suppose so. But I suppose time will tell, won't it? At the end of the day, if we listen to what we've heard from Claire and Claude and others, there's something about, you know, policy that needs to be adjusted, uh, uh, procurement that needs to be changed, pricing issue, and interoperability in creating a grid. And I suppose if you can very briefly just touch on... Given we don't have nationally binding targets, okay, let's, let's not quibble, uh, but it feels to me that you need that if you're going to create the momentum. How do, what's, your, what's your reaction to the need to kind of attend to those three elements as a part of the process that you're, you're working on? Uh, I think all the elements are indeed are essential. And uh, as I tried to mention uh, that, you know, already the uh, Fit for 55 package will have a dozen of different legal texts, uh -huh. including then EPS, which will uh, also look at the pricing uh, element, um, the proposal on trans-European networks, so on the grids and how grids are being planned. And that proposal was made in December as part uh, as the revision of the 10E framework. Uh, and then one element that I did not mention that uh, complements uh, the, the overall picture is uh, that we are working towards the end of the year uh, on uh, looking at how to make sure that we can get uh, hydrogen into the market, green hydrogen uh, into the market mm -hmm. and decarbonize the gas sector. So all these elements, uh, all these different pieces of legislation need to be looked at uh, together so that we then address all the elements of, uh, that have been mentioned. Indeed. Catherine, thank you. Thank you for being responsive to my challenging questions. But there is something about the urgency. There's something about making sure there's a kind of a policy coherence across the Commission on this one, in terms of various Director Generals, in terms of thinking about this agenda as being so fundamental as creating the almost the modern infrastructure for both the market but also energy as we move forward. Remy, before I kind of close down this debate, hour goes so quickly, doesn't it, folks? Um, we're, we're nearly out of time. Um, but Remy's been patient. Remy, can I invite you to introduce yourself and what your question or query is, or comment on what you've heard. Sure, um, I'm Remy, I'm working for uh, Ocean Energy Europe. Um, we believe that this directive should look at the end goal, that is um, 2050 net zero, and to reach that we know that we need to expand the portfolio of the technology that we have, and innovation will be critical. Uh, we see that from the assessment of the NECPs, um, innovation is not, was not a priority. So um, this, the revision of the directive should um, give way and, and incentivize member states to uh, create a market for floating wind, tidal, wave, and all those technologies that will help us balance the grid in electricity production in the future to reach our 2050 targets. Mm -hmm. And Remy, before you go, um, you know, your, you know, Ocean's Energy Europe, so wind and other types of uh, solar and other types of energy mixes are central to what you're about. Do you feel that we've lost the game already in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, you know, the raw materials, the production capacity to use oceans around Europe to really accelerate the energy revolution? Are we, have we lost the game or what do you think needs to happen? 
Not at all. Actually, uh, we're leaders in Europe in ocean energy. We have uh, the first pilot farms, but the competition is waking up. Now the US uh, have planned to invest more than 100 million a year in uh, research and development. The Chinese are putting feed-in tariff dedicated to ocean energy. So now is a clear moment to act to maintain our leadership. Good. I'm glad I asked that question because it gives a real indication to this group that like we missed the boat on solar, here's an opportunity for Ocean's Energy that let's kind of up the game and actually make sure we cede our advantage and be competitive and comparative in terms of advantage on this, in this space. I want to conclude by inviting some of our other speakers who started off this debate. Patrick, I'm not going to bring you back because I, I, I think you've set your stall out really well. I love, as I said, the policy pricing procurement nexus and I think that this sounds a very neat way of looking at this agenda as we move forward. Before, I'm going to ask Claude to say the final few words, because I think there's a the political dimension to all of this, and you're, I'm going to put you on the spot to respond to some of that, Claude, if I may. But let's go to NG. NG, going back to you, Claire, based on what you've heard so far about that, you know, the pricing, procurement dimension, but also the points that, that Katerina made, can you just respond to some of that from your perspective in terms of what you've heard so far, in terms of where we find ourselves, and what we where we need to be going in the next three years. Yes, thank you. Uh, pricing, full agreement with carbon price and mechanisms at the border. And that will be, uh, that will be very, very helpful. Uh, one thing I want to pick on is the, the debate on acceptance. I think it's hugely important. Mm. And indeed, we see this, this issue rising all over the place. What does it mean if we, well, some electric uh, renewable energy is facing some acceptance issues today. That's unfortunate. That's one more reason to take into account the fact that we need a diversified mix. Yeah. And if I may, a purely electrical mix with only renewable would, would, not, would not work. We need elements of flexibility and that's where it, indeed gas and green gases come back. I think we shouldn't be uh, dogmatic about this, but keep an open view on what's the best for the system to work. And last thing, uh, fully agree that there is a huge potential, industrial potential on offshore wind, and we are, we are a leader in offshore wind with uh, our Portuguese colleagues from EDPR. Uh, also, big industrial potential on green gases, so let's, let's not miss it. Claire, thank you. And I'm not going to ask you to respond to this question. It's just a, a, a deep-seated feeling of how resilient our systems are, given where we've just come from in terms of both the health and economic crisis. We know that both climate is going to slap us in the face, but so is digital. And we know that our future is digital. And not for you to comment on now, but perhaps to share with us in some written form or whatever, is that how resilient do you think our local systems are. You're a huge energy provider and in the context of hacking or a complete shutdown or the climate impact of let's say of a very ferocious uh, climate situation, how resilient our energy systems will be when you think about it here and now because my sense is we're nowhere near it but it'll be good to hear your view on that Claire uh, and perhaps I'll you know we'll bring you into that but if you want to say 30, 60 seconds on that that would be helpful. Yeah, different issues on digital. Uh, the first, whoops, yes, my mic is on, sorry. Uh, first, uh, first issue is the resiliency of the systems. And here, uh, indeed, I think in energy in particular, we, take a, we make a lot of efforts, a lot of attention to make sure that our systems are resilient. And like in all the others, I mean, there, there are attacks on our systems. We need to make sure that they, they, they still work. Uh, we have managed from crisis, put everybody in, in work from home. Exactly. So there is some resiliency, but it's an everyday effort, fully, fully agree. And second point, digital is key. Uh, we talked briefly about innovation, the role of digital, when in order to match uh, demand and supply in energy in particular, and, and of course to increase operational performance, digital is key for us. Claire, thank you. And I look forward to, you know, from friends of yours, welcoming you to another debate, especially around that issue of resilience as we look at because I think it's going to be key and a, one of the policy drivers, if you like, or a policy objective over the next 20 years or more. Um, Claude, if I can turn to you now for final remarks. Um, 
there's a political dimension to this. You said that you and your colleagues are meeting in June. Um, what's on the agenda for that, given what you've heard so far in terms of the directive, but also the issues around energy mix, the issue around procurement, uh, pricing? Are these going to be hot ticket items for discussion for you uh, in June and with your energy minister colleagues? So the energy ministers uh, are not directly discussing and not deciding on CO2 pricing, but sure. this is key on the ETS reform of the ministers of the environment. And it's clear we need uh, higher CO2 prices because this will gear the, the bigger picture on, on, uh, on climate investments. Um, back to the question of uh, targets. I think targets are important. But uh, and, and they should be as high as politically possible. And so maybe I have to adjust a bit my my from 40 to 50 percent. But this which is equally important is um, the stable support schemes. And uh, what uh, Katarina didn't mention is that we are also uh, very nervous about what will be DG competitions proposal on the next state aid guide plans for environment and energy Indeed, yeah. and I just uh, I hope that this will not be a neoliberal experiment we need uh, uh, non-market support for certain we need market support for renewables and, and because otherwise we will destabilize the market now is the moment to move fast mm -hmm. and the second thing which member states need is also the link with the job question yes. and sorry Biden has no problem whatsoever to put billions into a solar fabric in US. The Chinese don't have problem to do to give huge zero credit rate uh, rated uh, money to their solar manufacturers. The British will subsidize their offshore wind production. So I think we should really stop to be naive about this. Uh, this is a big chunk of the economy of tomorrow. So why don't we put more attention and reproduce our success story on batteries. On batteries, we were far away Indeed. from anything than on PV. So uh, throwing money into making uh, the, the next generation of PV with Maya Borga and others possible in Europe, I think that is extremely possible. If I have two final words Please. on green gas, um, also having experienced uh, the, the biofuel story, I think we should be cautious about how much biomass on, on land we, we, we promise, uh, because there is a food issue also behind. Uh, so I'm much less optimistic than Angie uh, on, the, uh, on the green uh, gases. And on, on, uh, on nuclear, um, look, uh, I, I, I'm really smiling when you say that can accelerate. <laughs> what is the reality? The reality is that the EPR the one in Finland took 10 to 12 years to be built, and it's a 20-year discussion. The one in France is also 10, 12 years. So 1,500 megawatt built in 10 to 12 years. In that period, I can do 10 times, 20 times more of offshore wind, of solar. So if you, if you really care about speed, and I think all of us have to, cared about speed, that nuclear is just not up to the, to the issue. The, what, the only thing which can help us, the only hope is fast, fast, fast PV rollout, onshore wind rollout, offshore wind rollout. Uh, I'm not against having also a quick breakthrough with ocean uh, energy. So we must go fast. And for that, we need stable uh, investments regimes and uh, we need also to, to, to stop this guarantee of origin uh, nonsense or greenwashing and making, transforming this into a long-term renewable PPA, real upfront new investment. So green hydrogen should be backed one-to-one -one with uh, eight, 10, 12, 15-year long-term contracts in new renewable investments. And because Otherwise, if we use guarantees of origin, uh, we will take away renewables from the electricity system to put it to the hydrogen system. That's nonsense. Uh, so the green hydrogen must come on top and the guarantees of origin cannot guarantee that. And therefore, we must change the system from guarantees of origin uh, to long-term PPAs. And last statement, let's be more optimistic. Look, 
Look what Paris and Brussels and Berlin and Munich and Vienna have done on, on cycling mm -hmm. uh, lanes. So, uh, and citizens are now taking a much more into biking than any time in, 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 in world history. So um, we can do it, uh, but we should, uh, so the most important is stable support schemes, mm -hmm. certain policies being Europeanized, especially uh, offshore wind. Uh, and then uh, let's also be ambitious on energy efficiency. Exactly. Uh, the CO2 and cars legislation, which is now in the making, is crucial. Uh, and personally, I think it's much, much less penalizing for citizens in Europe to be told in 2025, you can't buy a fossil car anymore. That's less penalizing than letting them buy a fossil car and, uh, and then having to introduce uh, CO2 uh, taxation of 150 and more for those who run fossil cars. So I really hope that the Commission is courageous in, in having a very tough CO2 and car legislation and phasing out fossil cars. That's for society much more easy to, mm. to accept than very, very high CO2 pricing on fossil products. Claude, I'm so glad I ended with you, because it's so refreshing to have a politician doesn't, who doesn't mince his words, and you've said it like it is. And, you, and thank you for nailing that argument about nuclear in the way that you did. Um, but, you know, you set out a very bold agenda, and there's something about this debate that everyone knows what needs to happen, but politics that simply won't shift in the right direction. But you're right, there are green shoots of optimism. We know there's been a change in terms of let's certain behaviours, but, you know, let's not forget uh, uh, that at the end of the day, there's a view that it's all about consumers and behaviour, but the system and the producers and the local authorities and governments need to wire around individuals and communities. They need to be able to support behaviour change. You don't expect it to come by itself, but also incentivise it. And the point you made about cars is absolutely well made. Um, how do you make sure you actually create a, a transition that's fair, inclusive, uh, and not penalising uh, those who are furthest in terms of inequality? Thank you all. This has been great. So what, one, one thing I will say to you, Claude, is that, you know, whilst there are people who can take leadership, and we've seen uh, leadership in this debate from whether it's, say, uh, a young woman... Uh, uh, who has you know, spurred a, a moment and a movement across the globe. I just hope that you as energy ministers, whilst you're not responsible, wouldn't it be great if in June all of you came out and banged that drum that you have just so solidly dr uh, driven in terms of sounded and heralded? Actually, colleagues, as energy ministers, let's stand up and do the right thing. Perhaps that's too bold and brave on my part, but let's look forward to what you're going to discuss. Thank you all for being with us. Um, keep an eye on our website for our future events. This debate is going to continue, um, colleagues, with us. So keep uh, you know, involved and engaged and look at our website for future events. One thing I would like to point to is that you know, we have a number of discussions that are coming up and have had in terms of what we do around the issue of industrial policy, energy, and broader issues around recovery. And I think that you know, if I would... I urge you to put one date in your diary is our, our State of Europe roundtable that we have in the October, which is intimately going to be about how Europe makes itself makes sense of itself in the future in the context of where we've just come out of. But looking at the drivers of industrial policy, consumption, behaviour, but ultimately a new social contract for Europe. So uh, on that, I'm going to end and conclude. Thank you very much. I've, this is Domendra Kanani, Chief Spokesperson at uh, Friends of Europe. It's been a delight to be with you. Uh, this has been a rich and enriching conversation, actually. And I wish we had more time, but I'm sorry I've run out and I've kept you longer than I should have. Thank you very much. Keep safe and mind your distance and see you again online again very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.